You're saying we're the American dream. Yes, you're the American dream. Finally, somebody sees it. (laughs) (laughs) How could you not be? Hey, I'm Troy. This is Darius, and that's Danny. We were college roommates and played football at Georgetown. During college, yeah, we do a lot of parties, <laughs> but at the same time, we were out in the community doing good. Our senior year, we met a guy named Frank Luntz. You might know him, you might not, but he's a very big political strategist. We started working with him, and he challenged us to take our experiences growing up in DC and go out into our community and make a difference. At the time, we would have never have guessed we would have grew good and raised millions of dollars, make a huge impact where we live and work. Darius, He's the one who's not afraid to speak his mind. He knows everyone. Me, I'm super empathetic. I'm in touch with the community and I know how to get things done. Danny, he's the go-getter. When we talked about the idea of starting good in college, he came home the next day to our dorm and said, hey guys, I found the paperwork. Along the journey, we linked up with the good people at Chasing the Dream and he challenged us to go out and explore the authenticity of the American dream. And this, this is what we found. Boom. Chasing the dream. <laughs> Minus one. <laughs> Next episode, we got my man Richard Gant. How did we find Richard Gant? Did you find him? Did Darius find him? I, I, I don't know. We can't ask him. He's not here. Yeah. <laughs> nah, it was at the Milken Conference. We, oh. At the Milken Conference. He's walking around like, I definitely see him on some movies. Like some oh, movies. He's been in a lot of shows and TV, TV series. Yeah. When did he debut in the eighties? Nineteen eighty looked like his first was his first. See? So there you go. That's forty that's about forty years been in the industry. He's seen it all. Yeah. American dream for him has definitely had to change. Also, I think we're scheduled to have his daughter too. And we have his daughter, we can definitely flip that as well. Like what's yeah. the, like how's the American dream feel different, you know, yeah. being the daughter of an actor. Yeah. Like, yeah. And does she even have like an American dream because she, is she already living it? I wonder if I wonder if for him it does it feel different? Like at this point mm-hmm. in time, like does it feel like the American dream is different for you, or does it just feel like you're just living your reality? Or has he even realized what the American, the new American dream is for young black men like ourselves? Yeah, maybe we could teach him something. You know, you never know. Hey, we are the American dream. Exactly. Yeah. So Richard, <laughs> you look good for seventy-five, man. You're seventy-five. You got your beautiful daughter. I'm seventy-five. Thank you. Thank you. Seventy-five. He's, He's, down. Down. He's not seventy-five. Nineteen forty-four. I did my research. Oh, look. Google always lying. Yeah, 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 1944. I'm not counting your clock by any stretch, Richard. Mm-hmm. You're I'm not saying, also yeah. telling the audience something they may not yeah. know. But this, uh, but I'm saying mm-hmm. as you start to get up and you, you are starting to see a lot of your friends go that you mm-hmm. came up with, how do you stay motivated? Like you talked about, hey, like I'm still working on new projects. But that's it. You know, um, uh, there's an excitement about what I'm doing yeah. now. You know, uh, Yes, I'm in the arts. Yes, I have a life in the arts. Yes, I'm on stage. Yes, when I kick out of here, I probably hope that I'm on stage. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. but I'm also yes, you were in Rocky. <laughs> no, I've I've had a good career, but the other things that I'm doing. Yeah. When I first stepped foot on stage, um, it was because of Langston Hughes. I was introduced to Langston Hughes in a in a, a theater class, a black literature class. Um, then I was introduced to um, uh, Wole Shoyenka, a uh, Nigerian playwright. And that became my passion then to, um, uh, to get black Americans and blacks from the diaspora in Africa together on stage as part of production. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's become my life's work. Yes. You know? What was it for you like to say, I want to be great? Because as I'm sure you know, there's a lot of people that even you grew up with and there's people that we surround ourselves with that we're trying to pour into them every day. You can do this, you can do that, you can be anything you want to be. It goes in one ear and out the other. But you made that decision at some point in your life that, hey, like, I want to be rich again. I mean, I was always doing something. There's no two ways about that. I was either the president of the junior choir or at church or, you know, or the usher board or, I, you know, something. Mm-hmm. Always. Um, then the service, you know, I was in the NAACP there in whatever little town that I was in, mm-hmm. kind of a thing. But when I got out, got back to school, I was at Merritt College, and I joined a black literature class, you know, stepped foot on stage for the first time, uh, and realized that that's where I was supposed to be. 
Dakota, what was it like for you, you know, growing up, watching this guy do his thing? Uh, so people have been asking me that for the past few days. Really? And I really don't have a good answer. Like, I don't have another dad. I don't know. <laughs> like, what is, it, what is it for you? <laughs> like, you know, like, what is, like, you know, like, I don't, I don't have anything else to compare to. Mm. Like, I, I don't know what it would be like to not. It's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> but the weirdest thing is like coming home and it's like hearing him and I'm thinking he's in the living room and it's, he's on TV and I'm like oh okay <laughs> like, we just came back from Ethiopia uh, Nigeria and Ethiopia this past Christmas <laughs> Ethiopia blew my mind you know? <laughs> <laughs> then we go to uh, back to Addis Ababa and we see the bones we see Lucy's bones Lucy the first person, the first woman. Yeah. What do you mean the first person? The first person. Like the first person ever. Yeah. I said learn about that in our, our history, Lucy. No. Yeah. What? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But see, that's not the killer. The killer is she's black. So what does that do to you? What, is that, what does that do now to your dreams of who you are, what you can be and want to be? In our work and, and the community we work in, do you think that, that seeing Lucy's Bones or exposing that to the kids that are in our programs would change their mindset? Hell no. Why not? No, I'm joking. I don't know. <laughs> why, why not? Why not? <laughs> it's just, well, for, our, for the younger kids, maybe. For the older kids, I think they've experienced such traumas and, and et cetera that they wouldn't be able to appreciate it at that point. I think it's a, some of them are too far gone in a sense with their experiences, where their head is at and what the American dream could be to them, honestly, and what the world is, that they wouldn't be able to appreciate it at that point. Um, I think the American dream, like in, in all senses that they, like you've been describing, is about um, expansion, like economic expansion, expansion of self-knowledge, expansion of the mind. Mm -hmm. So like um, most of the stuff, like uh, if you were to take children to see like Lucy or whatever, it's expanding their mind mm -hmm. and taking them out of whatever construct they've been placed in, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's really about like, you know, you see Lucy, but what does that do for who you are? Exactly. Like, what does it spark? Yeah. What does it spark mm -hmm. exactly? So it, like, even if you feel like you may be too far gone, what it fixes in you when you realize that you are more than mm -hmm. your experiences. You are more than, um, you are more than like what happened to you or your trauma or whatever. That, that is the American dream. Yeah. It's, it's interesting you say that because when we first started this work, working with our juveniles, you know, I used to tell them all the time, you know, you're bigger than your situation. Mm -hmm. Like you come out of the system as a 16 year old, right? Your commitment's over. And now you write a book on how you're changing your life. I'm like, some of these agencies that would have locked you up in these court systems that are locking you up, they now will pay you to talk to other right. kids yes. about, about right. how, you got, how you got out right. and how you changed your life. Right. If you're and just now, a normal African-American boy that's living every day, going to a bad school, not really knowing what to do, not much support at home, mm -hmm. I think you're, really, you're, you're less likely to be successful or have a trajectory of success than somebody who is coming out of the prison system who just served a long sentence for yeah. drug offenses because that person has more attention and more resources that are going to be focused on him when they return home. I think you're absolutely right. But by the time we help you, we've already taken away half of your civil liberties. So yeah. It's almost like a dependency thing, too, is yeah. that it, the system is almost set up as if I'm coming out of these communities. I want you to be dependent on me to make it out. Right. So, all right, right, you've now went into the prison system. You can only get certain jobs, so now mm -hmm. let me come right. in right. and kind of be your savior right. Right. and be helpful for you. Where it's, we're not setting up a system where people can be self-sufficient, like, self can mm -hmm. be independent. Um, and that's really troubling. Right? And I think that's why we always say us three are the exception to the rule, because at the end of the day, we went the normal trajectory. We were poor in a messed up situation, in a messed up community. And we fought through and did the right things and got into private school and got into one of the top universities in the, in the world and graduated and did our thing. Well, but it's a system. And, mm -hmm. and how do you break out of the system? How do you recognize that you're in a system and can break out? Mm -hmm. You have to because, recognize that you're in the system. Uh, uh, yes, but so you've identified this particular problem. Mm -hmm. 
um, uh, a regular kid, how, what's his, pro his trajectory? How, how does he project? Mm -hmm. And where is the help for him? Yeah, but I contend that the system is more pervasive than even that. I mean, you, you, know, you, you go to school, mm -hmm. right? You come out owing from forty to one hundred and twenty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and so you're already in the system. But then maybe the American dream should really be, be called the American standard, mm. right? The American standard is you end up in the system where you have a job, you're in debt, and you're just continuously paying bills, and you're continuously, and that's your life trajectory. And yeah, you have the opportunity to shift and to go from here to here, and industry to industry and career to career, but at the same time, you're still going to be in that debt system unless you become rich in somehow. And I would say that the, the color of your skin still factors into your ability to obtain that dream. But I think that I'm, I'm, I'm really naive in the sense that even as a black man, like growing up in this generation, I feel like there's nothing holding me back. Honestly, it's the generation. We're privileged. But, the next, we're, like, <laughs> we're privileged. but we're privileged because of our knowledge and our exactly. education. Yeah, that's what we're like, privileged. There's, yeah. there's levels to privilege. You have privilege because of your wealth. You have privilege because of your education. Mm -hmm. You have privilege because, because of your skin color. Because of your skin color, yeah. because of your access. There's different levels to privilege. And so you go into a top university, more than 1% of the, the world haven't had that privilege yeah. of receiving that level of education right. or access. Yeah, but how about, how about the notion that because I'm African American, mm -hmm. uh, uh, things are are better for me. I, Simply because that's how I think. Yes. Yeah. And that's how I approach the world. Yeah. And I think that's the uh, an attitude that yeah. those uh, people who are, have a positive of spirit uh, mm -hmm. need to have. Because I am this, I am that. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I I believe it's about spirit. I swear to you. If you if you if you can some kind of way believe that other things are possible, that I am greater than, or that there's other kinds of things out here other than what everybody's talking about. I, I, I believe that's it for me, mm -hmm. you know? And I believe that's my mission. <laughs> you say we're the American dream. Yes, you're the American dream. Finally, somebody sees it. I mean, <laughs> I mean, how could you not be?